So my name is Stacy Smith, and I am the Financial Center Manager of Fulton Bank over on North Wolf Street here in Baltimore. And my information is right here on the screen. It's uh, stsmith at fultonbank.com and contact number is 410-649-3150. We are going to run through a very high level um, objectives of our budgeting and how to create a budget and plan for a budget and track your spending. This is gonna take um, only about 10 minutes and then we're gonna move on with our presentation. So if you have any questions or anything after the fact, please feel free to reach out because there is a lot of information that we can cover uh, outside of, of today's presentation. So it's time to um, get down to business and define your relationship with your finances. Um, think of your financial goals and your money like you would a happy couple. If um, they may not always see eye to eye, but when they're both in harmony, you can do beautiful relationship things and that will last a lifetime. So we're going to go over these objectives pretty quickly. Um, first, we're going to start off with a list of steps for setting financial goals. So make a specific goal of what you want to do within a certain time frame. That's really important. You want to identify and write down your financial goals. Um, writing them down is really going to help you uh, stick to them and hold yourself accountable. Identify um, and organize your financial goals. So prioritize them, organize them, put them in an order. You know, do you want to buy a home? Do you want to buy a car? You know, what are your goals? Educate yourself. So do your research, educate uh, evaluate your progress. So keep tabs on, you know, every week, mm -hmm. keep track of your spending. Uh, how are you making your goals? Are you on track to your goals? You know, that goes towards your financial wellness and celebrate your accomplishments. So whenever you reach a goal, even if it's a small goal, be excited, celebrate it, um, you know, write, check it off your list or cross it off and, and celebrate it. Um, you want to track your daily spending habits. So why would you want to track your daily spending habits? Well, here are some things that can help you. It can help reduce anxiety. Um, I know a lot of people are very anxious when they don't know where their next paycheck is coming or how they're going to get their groceries. So this will help reduce that anxiety. Uh, gives you a sense of control over your money. So you're in control. You know where your money is going if you keep track of it. And that helps you build on assets. So when you have enough money to save up to buy a home, a home is an asset. And you'll learn that a little bit later today on um, the best ways to do that. So we wanna be here to help you build on your assets. Uh, so where do you know where your money goes each week? You know, ask yourself these questions. Where's my money going? Where, how did I spend this much money? I didn't realize, you know, understand where your money goes and track your spending. You can use a spending notebook, a spending tracking notebook, just like you would if you were trying to lose weight and you need to track where your diet, what you're eating. This is the same thing. You want to you want to track where your money is going. So track your daily spending and you you'll be surprised on how much money you actually spend that you didn't realize that was being spent. You know, going to Starbucks every day may not be in your budget. And if you like Starbucks, that's great. Go to Starbucks, but make sure you budget for that and make sure that's part of your spending goals if that's something you want to do. Um, you know, prepare a personal spending plan um, to estimate your monthly expenses and income. So this is a budget, you know, have a plan. Okay, I'm going to spend at Starbucks because I love Starbucks. Great, that's awesome. Spend at Starbucks, but make sure you budget for doing that. Um, you know, determine what your income and your expenses are. So what is income? Ask yourself, where do I make my income? Where's my money coming in to me? Is it from my job? Do I have a second job? You know, where's that? Is it social security? Is it a pension? Um, what are my expenses? So my bg e bill or going out to dinner, that's an expense that, you know, you got a budget for. So where are your expenses? Groceries, you wanna prioritize those. So you know, what should you pay first? Well, when you're creating a budget, you want to pay yourself first. And that means putting money in your savings account. 
and pay yourself first because then you want to pay all of your big bills. So you want to pay your mortgage, your needs, all your needs, and then your wants are going to come next. So mortgage, your utility bills, you know, you don't want to have gas and electric. Um, make sure you pay those first. And then your wants, you know, I want to go out to dinner. I want that Starbucks. Mm-hmm. Those may come later on the list. Um, So identify ways to decrease your spending. So tell me, you know, you got to think about how can I cut back on my spending? Um, You know, maybe I don't go to Starbucks every day. Maybe I go to Starbucks twice a week instead of every day. Maybe I don't go out to dinner every night. Maybe I buy off brand uh, things at the grocery store instead of name brand things. I don't really need the Kraft mac and cheese. Maybe I can get the store brand Craft, uh, mac and cheese and that's going to save me a couple bucks here and there and you'd be surprised on how much that that saves you and adds up and me personally I started ordering groceries online which has saved me a lot of money because now I don't go to the grocery store hungry I can check my cabinets when I'm at home to make sure if I already have it so I don't double buy things that I don't need and that saved me over about a hundred dollars a month just on you know buying groceries at home Um, You know, clothes shopping, maybe you only go clothes shopping once a month instead of every week, or maybe you reuse some of the items in your closet more often than you normally would. So those are just some ways you can decrease your spending. Um, So increasing your income, you know, try to think, do I make enough money at my current position? Is there a way that I can get promoted? If can I build my skill sets? Do I need to take on a second job? Should I drive Uber? Or do I have a skill set where I can charge and I can be a contractor? Or, you know, I can consult people that need help. Those are different ways that you can think about bringing more income. Or if you decrease your spending, like we just talked about, then that will increase your income as well because now you're not spending as much as you would have normally. And then finally, identify some spending tools um, that you use or could use to manage your spending and manage your bills. So, you know, I just some notes that I put down were you could do a monthly payment schedule and a monthly payment budget. Those are some great ways to um, keep track of your spending. You also can use um, an Excel spreadsheet. I personally use an Excel spreadsheet. Uh, for my monthly budget and and re uh, look at your budget, redefine your budget, budget, keep track of of what your budget is and try to, you know, organize that because every month it's going to change. You know, you may have some extra bills come in that you didn't realize that were were going to be there or maybe you had some extra income. So those are ways you should always keep looking at your budget and keep tracking it. Um, You know, you can do a expense envelope system if that works for you, budget box system. Um, But I personally like the Excel spreadsheet. And then for anybody who's tech savvy out there, you can use mint.com, you know, they have a spending tracker. If you go to your app store and you just type in spending tracker or, you know, money budget, there's gonna be a lot of different tools out there that you can use uh, at your fingertips on your app. And we also have Fulton Bank, we have money management tools with our online banking and mobile banking that can help you keep track of your spending as well. So, you know, managing your money to achieve your financial goals can be a daunting task. So, however, if you put your proper time and attention, your finances can be healthy and can be supported in any good, like any good relationship. So your finances change through the seasons of life and most relationships do. So acknowledge this and adjust and adapt uh, with the obstacles and the triumphs in your life. Um, Sit back and think about where you are and where you want to be and keep track of your finances. So that will keep you on track for a financial bliss. Um, Well, with that, I'm going to talk to Scott. If you want to take it off and talk a little bit about uh, credit. Absolutely. Um, Hey, everybody. Uh, My name is Scott Welkos. I am the uh, financial center manager at the newest location for Fulton Bank in Baltimore. Uh, we're at the Yard 56 um, financial or the Yard 56 shopping center uh, in the Bayview uh, Greektown neighborhoods. Um, so we're here to talk about credit a little bit. Um, credit can be 
kind of a confusing um, subject for, for some folks. So we'll try to just cover a lot of the basics uh, today. Um, but you do have my contact information here. If there's any questions that you might have, um, don't be shy about reaching out. Uh, we're here to, to help and, and get folks on the right path and all that. So um, please take a note of my information and reach out with questions. Um, or again, that there will be a recording of this presentation that's available to you afterwards as well. Um, so to start, uh, we just want to define credit. Um, so again, credit would be the ability to borrow money um, with the caveat that you have to pay that back later. Um, a lot of times you see that in the form of a personal loan uh, or a credit card or a mortgage or a car loan. Um, so when you get a uh, credit, basically the person or the company that is giving you the money is going to charge you interest for doing that. So that's a little bit of extra money on top of the amount you're borrowing um, that will be paid back. And the amount of interest that you will get charged is based on a couple different factors. That would include your income, your credit history, your credit score, and any collateral that you might be putting down for the loan. So collateral is basically something that you own that you are um, pledging to the company that's lending you money um, just to basically secure the loan. So if you make the payments and all that on time and, and as agreed, um, then you maintain your collateral item. Um, and if, if something were to go south with the loan and it didn't um, work out, then basically the lender has that collateral then to be able to um, you know, pay off the, the loan for you. Um, so examples of collateral could be a car, a house, or even uh, like a savings account. Um, and then, so why is credit important? Basically, uh, it's useful in times of emergency. So, you know, having access to funds when you need it in a urgent situation is huge. Um, and then it also allows you to pay for large purchases over time. Um, you know, most commonly you'd hear about like a car or a house. Um, and then also what, what some people might not realize is that credit can be used to help determine, um, you know, your eligibility for some jobs, um, for rental agreements for an apartment, um, or even getting insurance. So credit is, is really important to, to have a credit history to maintain your credit. Uh, a big part of that is a credit report. So basically there are three companies out there that um, collect your uh, payment information um, and put it into a credit report. Uh, those companies are going to be TransUnion, Equifax, and Experian. Um, so a credit report basically is a summary of all of the loans that you have or have had and the payment history on those loans. Um, they are used to help formulate a credit score, which is basically just a number that tells a lender uh, a little bit about, about how you are as a borrower and what your payment history looks like. Um, so credit scores are used to make loan decisions. Um, and again, they can go into uh, employment decisions, uh, rental decisions or insurance. So maintaining a good credit score is a very important part of um, your financial wellness. Uh, a credit score can range from a low of 300 to a high of 850. Um, and you really want to try to keep that as high as you can. Uh, the factors that will go into your credit score are going to be your past payment history, any outstanding debt that you have, um, how long you've had credit, uh, any new applications that you've submitted for credit cards or loans, and also the different types of credit you have. So, you know, having a few different types of loans out there, like a credit card and a mortgage, um, having a few different types is, is beneficial for your credit score as well. Um, so what some folks might not realize is that legally you are entitled to a free copy of your credit report once a year from each of the three credit bureaus that I'd mentioned earlier. Um, so doing that is, is a, a huge way to kind of get started um, being more mindful of your credit and, and making sure um, that your credit is in good order. Um, so if we could get the slide switched, uh, we will show you um, how you can go about getting a copy of your credit report. And you wanna make sure to go um, using one of these three 
channels because these are the government uh, approved um, methods for getting your credit report and then any other way that you might access your credit report um, it might not be legitimate or might be kind of farming your information. So um, please visit one of these um, channels and you're entitled to a free credit report and make sure you're looking at that. Um, so when you do get your credit report, what are you looking for? Um, so a big thing is gonna be errors that might be um, shown in your identifying information. Um, so that could be like your name wrong, um, an incorrect phone number, an old address. You wanna make sure all of your personal identifying information is valid and correct. Um, you also wanna make sure there aren't any accounts or loans showing on there that might belong to another person. Um, any accounts that you closed aren't showing as still being open uh, or definitely any uh, loans that aren't your own that you did because that could be fraud. Um, if you have an error that shows on there, contact that credit bureau right away um, and they'll help you fix that. Um, and then lastly, we just wanted to, want to touch real quick on ways to build or repair credit. Um, if you've never had credit or if your credit went uh, kind of bad for one reason or another, um, the easiest way to start would be to apply for a small loan or credit card. Um, if you're having trouble getting approved on your own for that, uh, one option would be to get a co-signer who does have uh, established credit to kind of go on the account with you. Um, if that's not an option, you can look at a secured credit card. So basically with that, they would take an amount of money that you would put up, they put it into a savings account for you, and then hold that savings account as collateral to give you a card. So that can be an option if you've um, had some credit issues in the past or um, if you've never had credit at all. Um, so again, that was a lot of information real quick. Um, but again, please reach out to me if there's any questions you might have um, or if you need any help with that. And we are more than happy to, uh, to help you out. But right now we wanna turn it over to um, Devorah, uh, who's gonna talk a little bit more about some um, home ownership uh, options that are available to you out there. Uh, again, my name is Scott, and thank you for taking the time today to talk to us. Hi, I'm Devorah Libney. I'm a CRA loan officer with Bolton Mortgage. And what I do is I specialize trying to help people that are first time home buyers and people that are trying to access the different grant programs that are available in Baltimore City and surrounding areas. And I can be reached if you have any further questions after this um, seminar, you can reach me at my cell, which is 410-207-7409. I'm going to just be giving a very brief overlay of the home buying process and how people get started looking into the different opportunities. Um, there's basic steps that are required for everybody who's just getting started looking at homes. And depending on whether you're at the beginning or in the middle, it really doesn't matter because um, this is a good refresher on what would be needed to tap into the different programs that are out there. So I would say probably the best place to get started is with education and the education piece is going to be a requirement for any of the grant incentives and there are so many available in Baltimore City and through Fulton that many borrowers are able to get into home ownership with very little out of pocket costs at their closing table. So I'm here to help you and guide you through that part of the process and hopefully see you at the closing table when you become a new owner. Um, so what I would really suggest is finding out those different housing counseling agencies that are part of the programs that are available in Baltimore City. And there are probably 10 to 12 that are active on the list. And I'd be happy to share with you a list of them after our meeting today. Um, so that is the requirement to get started before you even sign a sales contract. So it's a good idea to get started you know, looking into the different workshop opportunities, signing up for your one-on-one -on -one certificate, and this will give you a one year to really use that certificate and take that time to go through that process. Um, and you can jump into home ownership anytime after you complete that class. It's also a good idea to work with your loan officer to get pre-qualified somewhat simultaneously with this process so that you can be assured that there's nothing that's going to pop out that's on your credit report. And so we just heard about how important credit is. It's critical with mortgage that we have a full trial 
tri-merge, that means all three credit bureaus are showing scores and we're able to identify any issues that would be a barrier to home ownership so we can help you get that corrected before you're ready to go into a contract. So there's a lot of, a lot of help in learning about what's on your credit with your loan officer and also finding out what your mortgage range would comfortably be for you. So that's sustainable amount. So um, some, some people might have in mind a certain price, but we want to make sure that that price is going to work in your budget and you're going to get an approval. So once you get through your pre-qualification, once you get through your housing counseling and one-on-one -on -one with your housing counselor, then you're gonna be hopefully working with a realtor that is going to help you find homes in that price range. You're going to put together a contract, which is hopefully gonna get signed by the seller. It's a very hot market, very competitive. So, you know, I work a lot with the buyers and their agents to make sure that everything is known, um, that you know how much time frame you need to access the different grants and mortgage programs. And then you're gonna submit the loan into a uh, process processing. Um, it's going to be reviewed by underwriting. You're going to have an appraisal be ordered. There's going to be a title search, making sure that title is going to be clear and in your name. And then we're going to just get through the process. Usually it takes anywhere from 30 to 60 days. That's a general time frame. If you're doing grants, you probably will need a little extra time, usually between 45 and 90 days, depending on the grants that you're trying to tap into. Um, and then once everything is all submitted in, and there's a lot that goes obviously in between, it's unique to your circumstance. Um, so once we're all clear to close on the loan, then you're going to be able to get to your closing table and be able to finalize your whole entire home buying transaction. Um, so that's a lot of, a lot of steps, but um, again, it's not really that complicated. The main thing is really in the beginning, getting your education, getting comfortable with the process, finding you know, which realtor you're going to work with. Hopefully you'll work with Fulton because our products are amazing. We really do have the best products that are out there and we're tied into so many different grant opportunities. So it's like really the best place to be when you're trying to use all these special programs. And then the, we're gonna go into a little deeper dive now. So there are three main principles of the home buying process. And that's gonna include collateral, capacity, and you're going to also have to have an appraisal done. So what you're going to be looking at is on the capacity, your actual income that's coming in that we can qualify. So we are doing a very clear look at whether you're getting income from a W-2 or self-employment, or if you're getting income from something like a social security income or disability income, child support. So the loan officer is going to really detail the source and how much money you're getting. And there's a lot of little details, obviously, along the way on that. So I'm happy to discuss with you all after this. But um, we're looking at how much money you really have to show for your purchase. Then what we're looking at is credit. So we already did speak about credit before, but we're looking at that credit in a whole new eye to see how it's gonna fit into your mortgage. And certain mortgage products have different scores that you have to be eligible for. So if your score is at a 620 or up, you could be eligible for a conventional loan with Fulton. If it's a 640, then you could be eligible for an FHA loan. So we have to look at what your score is and do you have the right score for the program? If it's lower than the scores I just mentioned, it doesn't mean that you can't become a homeowner, but it'll have to wait till that score comes up. And we have resources that we can direct you to that are free of charge and they will coach you through the process and help guide you through some of these obstacles and hopefully in some amount of time, you will be able to get back into the process of being pre-qualified. Um, the other thing that we're looking at is collateral. So collateral has to do with the appraisal that is done on the property you're hoping to buy. So that is going to involve an independent appraiser to go out to the property, review that property, make sure that it meets all the requirements of an appraisal that the home's in um, basically moving condition. If it's something that needs a lot of work, there's structural issues, something very 
seriously bad is going on, you might not be able to do a regular loan. You might have to do a renovation loan. So they're looking at all of these things, plus they're setting the market price for that home. And that's something that your realtor in the very beginning of the process should be also helping you by comparing the home you're trying to buy to other homes that are selling or have recently sold in the area that you're looking to purchase. So that when you're making the offer, you're trying to get it at the right price so that it's not so high that you're not offering such a high price that it's gonna cause a problem when the appraisal comes in and your price of the home is actually lower. So these are all things that we're looking at. So those are the three C's of mortgage lending will include capacity, credit, and collateral. So just a little point on the jobs, because this is something that affects everybody. What are banks actually looking for when it comes to your job experience and history? Well, we are looking really back at two years. So if you have been working for the last two years, that's great. If you've been in school or a vocational program and you're now employed in your field, that's okay. We can often use the experience that you had in your college and your vocational training in lieu of two years of work experience. But you do have to be hired if you're going to be showing college. You can't be just still in that gap between hiring. You actually do have to have a paycheck coming in. And then we can review and see how much income you have. Is this job full time? Generally, in those situations, the underwriter wants to see a full-time employment after you've been in school. And then we're also looking at self-employment. So the big thing on self-employment, you have to have two years of file taxes showing that self-employment. If you don't have the two years yet, you're going to have to wait until you do have the two years to show. Um, so there's another point that sometimes affects people is on part-time employment along with a full-time job. So if you just started a new part-time job, you have to have had a two-year history working the full-time with the part-time job. So even though you're trying to maybe make some extra money for your purchase with a second job, that money's good. It'll go into your bank account to help you, but it can't be used simultaneously with the full-time job to qualify you for a higher um, amount for your loan. Okay, so now we're into a part that has to do with the documentation that the loan officer is going to want to see from you. I cannot stress enough the importance of filing your taxes. A lot of times people have in mind to do it. They may have even thought that they filed taxes, but what we do at Fulton, we actually will verify that those taxes over the last two to three years have not only been filed, but any remaining amount that is owed for taxes has been paid up in full to a $0 balance. So that is a very important uh, point to bring up. I wanna make sure everybody is aware of how important taxes having to be submitted and filed for both the state and the federal. And then if you haven't yet filed 2020, that's fine. If you're trying to go into a home purchase between now and the April 15th date, um, that is okay. We're not looking to have 2020 filed until after the filing date has passed. So right now you've got a break on the 2020, but we would be looking down at 2019 and 2018 to make sure that those have indeed been filed. We're also going to need the last full month of pay stubs. So those would be the actual pay stubs that you receive from your employer showing all the deductions, what your gross pay is, how many hours work, what your rate of pay is. We wanna see all of that over a whole period of 30 days. Um, we also wanna have bank statements and the bank statements need to be all pages. So if it says page two of three and you only give us uh, pages one and two, that's not gonna be enough. We need all three pages. If it's showing three pages, all pages have to be seen. And we wanna have everything really in a PDF way. So sometimes people try to take pictures of their documents and that really causes a lot of trouble with the underwriters. So now as you're all getting started, this is a great time to start putting your documentation into folders so that you'll have it ready when you start doing pre-qualification. Loan officer needs to see all the documentation at that stage. If you're applying for grants, that's another time that the uh, different agencies will be asking you to also produce your documents. So the sooner you can get started keeping your paperwork in one place so that it's all ready to go, it'll just avoid a lot of 
headaches down the road when you're trying to find all these documents. Um, so the bank statements for two months and keep in mind anything that's a large deposit. Um, you're going to maybe have things that you're doing some people do like Uber or they're getting cash app application, uh, you know, where money is being deposited into their account. And that's something that the underwriter is going to be asking questions about. They want to see why are you getting all these deposits? What are these large deposits? You know, where are they coming from? So explanations are going to be needed. So if you're in the situation where you have money coming in that could be coming in from something other than payroll or something other than like an IRS um, stimulus or something that you're receiving from the IRS, something that's clearly showing from a verified source, anything that's not verified, keep in mind you're going to have that be asked where it's coming from, why, all the questions on that. Um, any monies that you put into your account now is essentially seasoned if you wait two months. So like right now in February, if you're getting a large gift from somebody and then you're not planning on doing a loan until June, chances are that's never going to become an issue. So you're only going to have to provide the most recent two months. Anything that was already in there generally will not need to be explained. Um, you will also need to provide all your W-2s for all your jobs that you have worked over the last two years. So if you're missing W-2s, now is a good time to start trying to find the W-2s and putting them all together. Also, they will be asking for 1099s. If someone's self-employed, you wanna collect all these documents and have them ready. Also get your HR contact people um, for many jobs that you have worked for the last two years. So just make a list, who's the contact person because verifications of employment will generally be needed. They'll also be asking for a copy of your driver's license. So um, that's something that you just need to take a picture of that. And on FHA loans, it actually does get submitted. On conventional loans, we just use it to identify, make sure that you're the person that is applying into the loan, that it all matches up. Um, there's also going to be need for full taxes for anyone who's self-employed, all the schedules that come to be with your self-employment. So when we ask for federal tax returns, it's assuming that we're going to get the full tax return. No pages should be missing on that. And if you have any questions about anything to do with 2020 taxes that are coming up in terms of what documents um, you may be getting ready for that, you can always, always reach out to your loan officer. Okay, now if there's something like um, child support or you have something that you know is something unique to your situation, we're going to need to see all that documentation as well. At least six months of your um, child support being received plus birth certificates for the children that are receiving this child support and that we are going to be seeing that it is going to continue for at least three years. So if the child is already 17 and the child support is going to be stopping at 18, that's not going to work because it's not going to continue for three more years. So these are all, you know, unique situations and certainly you'll be talking to the loan officer about what your needs are for your income. Um, as far as other details, like sometimes people have had judgments or different things show up on credit report, we will want to see or collections even, we want to see that those in the cases where they have to be paid off are verified through your documentation. So there's a lot of documentation that's going to be verifying your situations. If you have collections that you're paying off before going into the purchase of the home, just clear off your credit that again, you want to keep all this documentation in place because it will be asked for. And the sooner you can get it into one package, the easier your loan process will be. Now we're going to just jump into, I think we have a few more minutes. I'm going to talk a little bit about the grant opportunities that are available in Baltimore City. Um, so first I'll start off with what we have at Fulton. We have a uh, first front door program, which is a $5,000 first time home buyer grant. It is not a lien on the property. It's great. You can actually start April 5th and you can see if you qualify, it is based on household income and family size. So just going by last year, it was about close to 55,000 for a one person household for your household income. And it went up gradually with each additional um, person in the household. So uh, 
for like a two-person household, it would be, I think it was around 63. Those income limits are probably going to change out for 2021. We do not have them yet, but I'll be happy to help you as we get closer to the April 5th um, start date. That's going to be the launch. And the way that program will work is that you just have to submit your pay stubs. You have to do a pre-qualification with Fulton, and we can apply you into that grant even before you've even gone into a contract to buy the home. So that makes a lot of sense when you're out there looking at homes and you know you have 5,000 already waiting for you as a grant to help you with your closing costs and possibly down payment. Also at Fulton, we have something called a closing cost assistance program. And that program will help you with up to $2,500 in additional money that you can apply to your closing costs. Um, Let's see with Baltimore City, there's five different programs. There's a CDBG, which is for the low to moderate income households, which will follow the same guidelines, I think, as the first front door did last year. And that is an additional $5,000 uh, to help you. And that will take about 90 days, though. I will tell you that is a grant that does take some time. But if you have a seller who's willing to wait, it's a great program. There's also going to be the Live Near Work program. And that's a true grant. It's there to help you if you work for certain employers. And that can vary depending on who your employer is and if they're participating. Um, it's a good idea to look at the Live Near Work list of employers. There are people who can also sometimes add in your employer. You can ask them if they'll participate. I've seen that happen. Baltimore City employees get $5,000. Um, that's great money to come in and help you and you can stack all of these up. There are some properties that are listed as vacants to value. And that will give you $10,000 if you're buying one of those properties. Um, and you can, again, stack all of these great programs together. And then three times a year, there's a trolley tour. So the next one is coming up in May and that is $5,000 and 20 winners. 20 winners at each event. So there are three of those. They're usually timed in May, September and January. And then we also have some great programs over at Fulton. Um, three that I would just like to bring up quickly. We have a, a, a program called Homebuyer Advantage Plus, which we can even work with people who have never had a credit score. And that program, you need only one year of work, of work experience and a 620 credit score. And it also gives you a lot of other perks along the way. There's no mortgage insurance with that. We also have another program through Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac um, that also gives you no PMI with 3% down. And we just got a brand new program called Fulton Bank Community Combo, which is basically 100% fully financed down payment. You have no down payment requirement. So if you're getting all these um, other grants, even if you just get one or two of them, you basically are able to get into a home without having to worry about putting much more than your earnest money deposit and your appraisal and your inspection. And it's just remarkable and it is working for people. So I hope you can be the next homeowner that is gonna get at your closing table, the key to your new home. I'm here to help you with any questions and I thank you for joining us today.